Change lives. Cambiar vidas. Change lives. Change organizations. Guy, bien, shit. Change organizations. Change organizations. Change the world. Good afternoon. On behalf of the oral history program of the GSB Library, I'd like to welcome you to today's event on the history of venture capital education at Stanford. My name is Paul Rice, and this is the second in the series of events on the history of the Graduate School of Business. I'd like to take a moment to recognize some people whose support made this event possible. Kathy Long, director of the GSB Library. Cheryl O'Loughlin of the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. Sharon Marine and Andrew Sharp of GSB Development and Rafe Beck of GSB Alumni Relations. And a special thanks to Professor Chuck Holloway for his guidance and advice in uh, organizing this event. Just a reminder that this event is being filmed. Now on to our panelists. We're fortunate to have a very distinguished group today, gentlemen who have all been involved for many years in teaching about venture capital at Stanford. Starting nearest to me on the stage, Peter Wendell, Founder and Managing Director of Sierra Ventures and Stanford GSB Lecturer and Course Head of Entrepreneurship and Venture Capital since 1991. Pitch Johnson, Founder of Asset Management Company and Lecturer in Management at the GSB. Charles Holloway, the Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield and Byers Professor of Management Emeritus at the GSB who's kindly agreed to serve as our moderator. And John Glenn, actually there, I think we're a little out of order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. John Glenn, founder and managing director of Glenn Capital Management and lecturer at the GSB. This event will last one hour. There'll be an opportunity toward the end for questions and answers. So please wel welcome our panel today. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a particular pleasure for me to be here with these three uh, gentlemen who not only have evolved, created and evolved the uh, venture capital curriculum at the Stanford Business School, but they've also been uh, major players in the venture capital community here in Silicon Valley. Um, so we're, gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about their personal backgrounds, and then we're going to talk about um, uh, the, the courses here at Stanford and how they evolved. A um, little bit about their alums. Some of you out there may be uh, um, past participants in their classes, and um, uh, something about uh, uh, the impact they might have had on Silicon Valley. So I want to start with the uh, personal backgrounds. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start with Peter. And Peter, uh, just, just what led you to a career in venture capital? You, you started off working as uh, actually a salesman for IBM, if I recall. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, my early career right out of college was with uh, IBM, and um, I spent um, uh, two years at IBM and then had two years off for good behavior to go back to business school, um, which I went to that other business school, and um, then returned to IBM uh, for another five or six years. Um, and um, although I wasn't an engineer by background, um, it was clear to me from my work at IBM uh, the tremendous impact. This was in the uh, early mid-70s. The tremendous impact that uh, technology was already having on all aspects of business, and particularly um, the technology coming from the West Coast. So um, in uh, 1981, at the end of 1981, um, I was... Um, I was approached by a couple of wealthy families to ask if they would, um, they were interested in getting some of their assets in the venture capital uh, uh, realm of investment, and they asked if I would consider leaving IBM to form a venture fund to do that. So that really took a lot of the risk out of it for me because we had a ready source of capital. So um, I just thought it would be more fun to kind of look for the next IBMs rather than spend my career at um, uh, a single large employer. Um, so that's kind of how it came to pass. And your uh, undergraduate was at Princeton. Yes. Where you've undergrad. actually served on the trustees for 10 years and been the, the chair of uh, the trustees. And, and uh, 
So you basically were an East Coast boy until you became a venture capitalist. Well, when I came to California, I uh, knew about uh, two people here. Yeah. Uh, fortuitously, one of them was Scott Cook, who uh. Uh, we were fortunate to write a check and back in and to uh. it. So uh, Scott and I were at Harvard at roughly the same time. So if you only had a very small Rolodex, it was, <laughs> it was a good one to have on there. Yeah, exactly. Right. We're, we're glad you came out. Well, I'm the rookie of the group here. I'm sure the veterans will have more to say. So, Pitch, what about you? How did you uh, <clears throat> uh, distinguish career at, uh, at Stanford and at Harvard MBA? And what lured you into venture capital? Well, a, sh a short version is Palo Alto High School, class of 46. And I thought of myself, not primarily, but heavily as an athlete, as a runner and track athlete. So came across the El Camino to run and study. And I also loved technology, so I became a mechanical engineering student. And um, I did pretty well in that and did okay with my running, although not uh, not. Olympic class like well, my Peyton dad. Peyton Jordan said you did all right. Pardon? Peyton Jordan said you did all right. He was your coach, right? Yeah, no, he wasn't my coach. My coach was a guy named named uh, Jack Weirich. But anyway, I had a, like Stanford can do. I had a good career in, in both my uh, engineering and at uh, and, and running. Then um, <clears throat> I applied to um, Stanford Business School and Harvard Business School and interviewed for both. I got into Stanford, but I didn't get into Harvard. Uh, so I went back east to run in our national meet, and I went up to Boston and told the uh, admissions director that, how could you pass me up? I got great grades. I'm a nationally ranked athlete, and I want to go here. And, and I had made a mistake and told the recruiting guy that uh, named Saltonstall that uh, I, I wanted to go to business school to find out what business was like because I wasn't familiar with it at all, which is true. Mm -hmm. I, was a, I was a coach's son. My mother was an English teacher, and I, I only met businessmen more or less when I met the parents of my fraternity brothers. So anyway, they finally let me in when after I pounded on his desk and um, f finished up in a couple years, uh, like everybody, and uh, went in the Air Force during the Korean War, got out, and uh, because I was fascinated by a, a job I had in the summer working in a steel mill, I got a job with Inland Steel working in the open heart of the shop and became a foreman and later on a melter foreman, which means you run a bunch of furnaces. That was terribly exciting. But uh, more important for the future, I met Bill Draper, who was a salesman. He had just got out of business school himself, having been in the military first. So we moved in company houses near each other, and our, we became good family friends. And he became a salesman for Inland, and I eventually, after some training, became a foreman, later an assistant superintendent of a shop. So then um, Bill came out and joined his dad in 1958 in a pioneer venture fund called Draper, Gaither, and Anderson. And in 1961, I came out for the big game. This is an audience. I don't have to explain what the big game is. <laughs> so so um, we cooked up a SBIC, which is a, a deal where if you put up some money of your own, you could borrow a lot of money. And, and so in 1962, Bill Draper and I started Draper & Johnson Investment Company and uh, did that for three years and did some really good deals because the t timing was good. Sutter Hill bought our portfolio. Bill went with them, and I was going to go find a company and buy a company to, to run, be a quasi-entrepreneur, but I kept finding deals to do, so I became an independent venture capitalist in the end and gave my company its name in 1965, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, as of now, uh, I'm a limited partner only and not a general partner in our new fund, so which is the ninth fund uh, that we've done. So. Uh, I got into venture capital because I had a good salary and I loved my job. I regretted leaving the open hearth as much as any decision I've ever made, but I knew working for a salary was different from forming capital. I also noticed in the annual meeting of Inland Steel Company, the grandchildren of the founders had 496,000 shares each, <laughs> and I had an option on 42 shares. So I said, wait a minute, this isn't working right. But I, I, did, I did miss the open hearth. I missed the kind of men and, and women I worked with. but. Uh, uh, it's been a, it's, it was, the timing was good, venture capital was building during that period, and it's changed a lot. We can talk about that later. Yeah. Good. So, John, <laughs> University of Virginia to Stanford Business School? Yes, I grew up in Virginia, came out here in 1965 when I graduated from law school, went to work for a large law firm in San Francisco, 
four years later, figured I loved study of law, but the practice of law wasn't the right fit for me. And I had worked for a senior partner in the law firm that represented Hewlett Packard, which was then a private company at that time, and also was on the board of Stanford. So through the work I did for him, I had a little bit of window in the very early days. What and firm was that, John? McCutcheon, Doyle, Brown, and Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Bob Brown. Uh, I had uh, a window on what was going on in the early days of uh, the Silicon Valley development. So um, I went uh, to the GSB and graduated in 1970. I was probably an odd person in my class because I knew what I wanted to do when I graduated before we started class the first year. There were then about 15 venture capital firms in the country. Pitch was one of the leading venture capitalists, and frankly, he was one of my heroes and still is, for that matter. So uh, I uh, left the practice of law. My mother never understood why, but uh, became a venture capitalist. Uh, founded my own firm in 1975, and I've uh, been active uh, investing in small private technology companies ever since. So thank you uh, for that, uh, those very colorful backgrounds and a very different paths to uh, the venture community. Um, so, so let me just ask you just briefly, so John, starting with you, uh, how has the VC world changed since 1970 when you started your career, right? Yes, that's, that's exactly uh, when I started. I think the amazing thing about the venture capital business, it used to be a very small group of firms. Boston, a few in New York, one or two in Chicago, and then a collection of individuals like Pitch that had their own firms, but always invested together as part of the local technology group. And it was then a club. We used to uh, go up to monthly meetings for the Western Association of Venture Capitalists in San Francisco when all the young guys would trade their best ideas with their friends and invite each other to take a look at the exciting companies that we were looking at. Well, that was 1970. I think it was 1974 when the Department of Labor ruled that uh, it was appropriate for pension funds to invest in venture capital partnerships. And after that, uh, for the subsequent period of time until the current uh, time, we really saw an avalanche of money coming into venture capital. Venture capital is an asset class that's accepted by institutional investors and uh, Huge participation. Well, that has brought many, many more uh, individuals into the venture business in the United States and other parts of the world, and a huge amount of capital. So today we have a pretty impersonal business. We rarely share our deals with our best friends, and uh, it's pretty darn competitive. But it's a great business, and I think it certainly works for the best interest of the entrepreneurs who are out there trying to raise money. But you know, that's my perspective. Pitch, you've seen it all. Uh, do you agree with John? Uh, essentially, that uh, it's grown from little to big. I, I don't. There's nothing to disagree with. He's quite factual in his report. Thank you. I would say the. What that, about sharing your deals? Well, I don't think I should be his hero. I have a number of reasons that's true, but I won't go into them all. <laughs> um, in '62, uh, there already was such a business. There was a th three or four firms. There was Draper, Gaither, and Anderson, as I've already mentioned. There was a firm, Data Science Ventures. I guess that was back east, although there was a, there, there was, anyway, we got, to, we got together for lunch, or dinner, I guess it was, about once a month, and there was 12 members of this sort of informal group. And uh, some were doing more real estate, but of the, of the 12, I'd say five guys or firms were doing venture capital. Uh, it was quite cooperative. Everybody knew everybody. If you wanted into a deal, you simply had to call up somebody. And if you wanted partners in a deal, you just called them up. And it was not competitive because there was not so much money in the business. Um, then as some companies became very visibly successful, money came into the business. People formed limited partnerships, which Draper, Gaither, and Anderson was, and they had outside money. And became more and more competitive as firms were competing, not just to do deals, but to have success to raise money. And I think that factor 
became, made it more competitive. But the main thing that made it competitive was that as Tandem and other companies became better known and were successful, uh, and including maybe uh, uh, Genentech, uh, money just came into the business. People wanted to invest in venture capital. Peter had friends who wanted to get into it pretty early on anyway, but it became a kind of a good place to invest and became known. It was not, uh, it was not something that everybody heard of. And then it, it, it went pretty well for a few years and then it kind of faded away and there was a wonderful cartoon in The New Yorker where these two obviously prosperous old guys were sitting in a club and one said, Samuel, whatever happened to venture capital? And, uh, and that was in the, in the mid 80s when there was kind of a low spot. And, uh, but in the end, it was a necessary function in our, in our entrepreneurial society to have a place where people who wanted to start a company could go get enough money to get going, and then, um, and then uh, build their companies, uh, and then get growth capital as well. So there was, there was the early stage capital, there was a second round often to get a, a product in the marketplace, and then growth capital to grow, even though you're profitable, you didn't generate enough cash to grow as quickly as, they, as you could. Um, the evolution was sort of straightforward uh, in terms of entrepreneurs looking for money and people looking for entrepreneurs for a long time. It, there was ups and downs when the stock market went down, companies couldn't go public, and that certainly was true early in this decade. But the emergence of the social networks, the social deals, uh, uh, obviously like, uh, like uh, Facebook and Twitter, sort of changed the venture capital business as well as changing the uh, changing the way we do things. And Apple, sort of, Apple was not a successful deal to start with. It struggled and struggled, and it wasn't until Steve Jobs came back and did it all over again. But, but the, the, modern, uh, the, the modern venture capitalist has to be really on top of these trends. There's, there's a lot of money looking for, for uh, investments. The, the huge kinds of returns that occur when, within four or five years, you can make 100 times your money, as, as is happening in some cases. So the, the fundamental business is the same. You've got to find some companies and have, have entrepreneurs believe in you, or at least find you, to, to be successful. And it isn't quite, it isn't very cooperative among the firms. It's honest among the firms, but they don't show each other their deals. And they don't invite people, people back and forth that much. But uh, right now, though, You've got to have somebody who's in touch with the trends in the use of communications devices, handhelds, uh, computers, and, and that sort of, sort of stuff. But there, there is no question that we're in a very vast revolution going on involving the use of portable computing. And, and it has changed our business in the terms of the kind of people who will be alert to those issues. I would say, as a firm with old guys like in their 40s in it, um, we didn't properly see the uh, social networking deals in time to really get involved in them. But that's, you know, true confessions maybe, but I think that's true. And I think that some people did, however, and there were, there were early investors in Facebook and Twitter and those companies, uh, but it just, it wasn't us. Now we're, we've got some other things cooking, but uh, that, 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 those kinds of companies and the rapidity with which technology and markets are changing changed the business. So Peter, uh, 1982, uh, still a little bit uh, collegial, and then uh, moving up, as they said. Uh, how do you keep? Uh, how do you see this evolution, and how do you keep Sierra evolving with it? Yeah. Um, well, 1982, uh, our first fund was a 16 million dollar fund, and. Um, the industry, so 1982 when our firm started, um, it was uh, before cell phones, uh, before FedEx. Um, we had fax, but barely, you know the thing you'd wrap around the drum and put it on the, you, you know, so it was a, a very different time. But instead of cell phones, we had um, what at the time, if you wanted a phone in your car, you had something called a radio phone, which was a big thing that sat in the trunk. 
Uh, a lot of uh, people in the construction industry had it because they had to drive from job to job. But there were about uh, maybe seven or eight of us in the venture business who spent a fair amount of money to get one of these phones. And one feature of a radio phone is you can hear all the other conversations, and there's only nine of them. Uh, it was, uh, there was three, there's three towers in the Bay Area, one in San Jose, one in Oakland, one in San Francisco, South San Francisco. Each could handle three phones, simul three conversations simultaneously, and everyone could hear everyone else's conversation. So, um, by definition, it was a bit collegial because <laughs> <laughs> you can, and, uh, the, 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 sh the shrewder ones knew how to kind of uh, hype a deal uh, yeah. <laughs> through some uh, conversation you may or may not really be having with your partner about it. But um, uh, I think if, if we look at the change and growth of the venture industry, and particularly the implications of that for our students and for our work here at Stanford, um, you know, as the size and scale of the industry has grown so much, as, as John and Pitch both said, in the, 1982, when we raised Sierra Ventures One, there were uh, about $4 billion of new commitments into the venture industry. And uh, last year, when my younger partner just closed, did the first closing of Sierra Ventures 10, there was uh, about 20 billion, give or take, which was a pretty measly year. I mean, it wasn't, it was a quite low year. There's been years as high as um, uh, 100 million, 100, 100 billion, or 105 billion, to go back to 99, 2000. So huge, huge run up in assets under management. And in some ways, I think that's forced a formalization of the business. Um, it, it is a business now, it's not just two or three people kind of sitting around um, uh, playing their hunches out on investments. That's made the industry, I think, more cognizant than ever of looking for uh, MBA trained students who have some, some formal financial training. Um, what, what hasn't changed is that um, it's still 100% focused on innovation. And I, I think younger people in a firm tend to maybe have some of the best ideas. Uh, uh, venture capitalists with more experience have a better sense of how to get a deal done, how to structure a deal, and so forth. But in terms of where the innovation really lies in the coming years during the liquidity cycle of an investment, um, younger people who come into a venture firm often have more of that DNA than older people who are already there. So there continues to be an interest in younger people coming into a firm. Nowadays, the National Venture Capital Association has uh, six or 700 member firms. Even in 82 when Sierra was formed, I think there were about 130 firms at most. So a lot more opportunity, it's a lot bigger business. And I guess the last thing that strikes me in terms of changes is that since it's now a factor in the financial market, it's not a huge factor, even at 50, 60 billion dollars a year, that's not a huge factor. But it's much more subject to the uh, cyclicality of any financial market. Any financial market, as we teach here, is, is going to have periods of cyclicality, where it's an attractive market, capital runs in, uh, too much capital comes in, it becomes unattractive, then the capital flows uh, subside. And the same has gone on in the venture industry, and that means that our students sometimes are graduating during times of great expansion, sometimes right. not so. And, right. um, but um, it's interesting that in our three backgrounds, all of us represent so much of what's happening with our students today, whether it's McCutcheon and Inland Steel and IBM. You, you, people often start their careers before they come to the school here at larger right. places, or initially go to work at larger places, but quickly, look around and say, you know, I don't think, as hard as it is to leave my friends and my good colleagues, as Pitch was saying, I, I don't think this is really what I want to do for my life. And that's kind of the decision the three of us made, and I think it's very similar to the students who come see me every week and Still. want to talk about their Still future. today. Yeah. The, the things always look more interesting in the future than right. they <laughs> look in the current. Right. Well, thank you. And, and um, to turn now to Stanford and, and the courses that we have here, um, I know that uh, both Peter and John uh, were influenced uh, coming to Stanford uh, by Pitch. And so let me start with you, Pitch. So what, what brought you to the Stanford Business School to begin to teach? And, and tell us a little bit 
about that. And then, then as you see the evolution of, um, of, the, of the course while you were involved. Well, I came here to the business school first because Greg Peterson, a friend of mine, uh, who had been at Sutter Hill, got a different job and was moving. And he had been teaching the Formation of New Ventures course here through the late 70s. It had been, uh, it had been teaching of entrepreneurship had gone way back at Stanford under the leadership of was it Frank? Frank Schellenberger. Frank, but, but Frank Schellenberger. Frank Schellenberger, yeah, Frank Schellenberger. I don't even know how far back, but way, way back into, uh, into the, probably in the 60s and 70s. But it was just a, an isolated course and an interesting thing to study entrepreneurship and not a sort of a big thing, as you'd call it now. Anyway. And, and this, this was formation of new ventures, yeah. not venture capital. No, but I'm going to sort of transition right. from how to that. I just wanted to make sure the audience understood so that. So what happened was that uh, Greg Peterson was teaching this course on formation of new ventures, and he said, could you fill in for me for a year, because I have to leave in a hurry. And so I went to see Jim Van Horn, who was the dean in charge of that area, and uh, I said, I'd, I'd like to do this. And, and so Jim hired me, actually. So the first year in 1979, I took over that course without with very little experience except having gone to business school and heard a lot of, and I used the old uh, HBS and Stanford uh, cases, but I felt um, I didn't like the course that much myself. Uh, it was uh, kind of set in the ways of the cases that had been written. So the second year, because I wanted to get the entrepreneurs involved, I used cases out of my own files. And it was, it, 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 besides some lectures and tests, there was about 14 sessions that I had. So I developed these cases. I would take the, take the business plan out of my files, write a very clever, very clever cover letter on it to describe the situation that the student should think about. And, uh, and I also gave the students the option then of talking about it uh, as a entrepreneur and how they would handle the situation, or how they would handle it if they, had, if they were a venture capitalist and began look at it. I don't know why I did that, except I think several students asked about that because they knew I was a venture capitalist. So as you might guess, since MBAs vastly preferred to judge rather than be judged, uh, <laughs> most of the people chose the venture capital option. I also, in a more formal moment, think the market was speaking. There was an interest growing in venture capital, and students wanted to study it. So then the next year, I did the same thing. And I don't know exactly how the timing or nerve growth spike got here, but it was in a year or two. A very able teacher from Harvard Business School, a, a lecturer, I began teaching the same course with the same name, but different content. So my, in the course that I was doing, I had uh, a bunch of cases with the entrepreneur being the guest that day. And you had to write a business plan, which I had inherited from the course before me. So we had, a ca we had cases every day. We had two midterms. One was quantitative about IRRs and that sort of thing and pricing deals. And the third thing that was, was a written analysis of a case, which I felt so it was Im important. But uh, there was such a strong interest in it. So when kids learned, kids, students learned that they couldn't take both my course, which was still called the same name, Formation of New Ventures, and um, Irv's course, which was had the same number even, they thought, well, that's not a good reason we can't take both our different courses. And people would say, but they have the same number. That didn't wash. So I changed the name of uh, the course that I was teaching to Entrepreneurship Colon formation of new venture, uh, uh, venture capital. And, and Irv's course uh, was entrepreneurship colon formation of new ventures, and they became separate courses. And they stayed separate, and I kept on doing it and adding different cases and limiting some cases. I, 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 I added two cases in. First, I added in a case with a woman entrepreneur, but the company didn't make it. And so I had a delegation come up, as you might expect, after class and say, couldn't we have a case in which the woman entrepreneur makes it? So then I, I found uh, uh, one, and uh, the woman that makes the Nancy's, uh, Nancy Mueller made these little quiches and built quite a good company. So she not only succeeded, but she brought quiches with her in her part <laughs> of the session. So I became a little more popular there for a little bit. So um, I did that, and I really didn't change the format much, except 
I really believe that the students, the, the, the course was full, and the, the complaints we got, it was too hard work. They said, on top of all this, we have to write a business plan? But um, I said, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it, it was, remained a popular course, and so then, about, I had been doing it, I couldn't travel during that period, and I, I, I liked it, and it led to lots of other things, which I, I won't bother right now with, other than it led me into Eastern Europe for, uh, for, because of my, some of my writing. And so in 1990, I decided to make it my last year, and Peter Wendell was there, uh, available, I guess. I didn't actually make the contact, and Pete's taken that, whole, that course to a whole new level. But at least the beginnings of the course were in my era, and I loved doing it. The students liked the course because it was full and highly rated. Uh, and I feel, I feel good about having spent those 12 years because I think it started something quite useful. Well, it, it really did, Pitch. And as you say, it evolved uh, from a general course in, in Formation New Ventures to the Venture Capital course um, and got it on the road to what it is now. I, I remember Pitch uh, very well because when I was an associate dean, um, one of the things that I did periodically was give feedback to the faculty and to the lecturers, although I really never gave any feedback to the, to the lecturers except for Pitch. Every year, Pitch would come into my office and demand that I take the time to find it, to get an evaluation and give, give to him. And Pitch, I always admired you for that. You're the only lecturer that ever did that. Um, I did, that's new news, thank you. Um, yeah. uh, well, the course was more popular than the instructor, I'll say that, because... <laughs> Not uh, true. Yeah. So, so uh, we know a little bit about how Peter got uh, here, but John, how did you get to Stanford? Well, <laughs> I started pounding on my old professor's door, Chuck Holloway, and said, look, uh, I've got a little bit of experience, and I'd like to give back some of it to our students. Could I find a way to teach at Stanford Business School? Chuck was always polite, but I never got that positive answer that there was an opportunity. But one day, one day, uh, he told me that uh, Irv Grossbeck had taught a very, very popular course, and there was so much demand that uh, the school is considering offering a, a second uh, section of uh, formation of new ventures. So I teamed up with another gentleman, and uh, he and I launched that course for a couple of years. Dick Allen, whom many of you know, uh, we really enjoyed working together. Dick commuted from Southern California, and it was a bit cumbersome for him, I think, so he finally turned it over to me. I took the course for a few years, and then with a consultation with, with Irv and Chuck, I decided to launch a, another section of uh, the Venture Capital course alongside Peters. And, uh, so I, in my 20 years, uh, I tried to develop uh, themes, topics, issues that I thought were leading edge in the entrepreneurial world for students to discuss. Over that time, we de developed about 35 business school cases, and I would try to get the protagonist about whom the case was written to come and share their experience with the students. A couple of them were women, a couple of them were people who failed. That was probably the hardest part. The people who failed loved to come, but they didn't want to really be too explicit on why they thought they failed. In fact, after you heard their explanation, it was hard to recognize that they failed. So anyway, we had a good time with them. <laughs> the, the students uh, have really evolved in this school. I, I go back to my days here as a student, class of 1970. Very few people had any entrepreneurial interest. There are some people in the entrepreneurial area now, but not, not at the time of our graduation. But today, the fervor, spirit, interest in being an entrepreneur is very pervasive here at the, here at the GSB. And I think in my 20 years of teaching, I became even more reinforced in that conclusion. One, we've got super bright students, and maybe it's the Stanford culture and location that attracts them, but we have a lot of really bright future entrepreneurs. So, you know, we had fun. I tried to teach the course. It was called Venture Capital in the Entrepreneurial World, really launching a company and building a company from the standpoint of an entrepreneur working with a venture capitalist. So I probably put a little bit more venture capital spin on it than some of the formation of new 
adventurous courses, but thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, you know, like Pitch and, and Peter, uh, I never stop answering inquiries from former students who either want to launch their own business or transfer to a new opportunity or talk about what's going on in the world. It's a very rewarding experience and a wonderful pleasure and opportunity to be exposed to so many bright young men and women that are going to do great things. One way in which the business school changed, when I got going, you couldn't get ahead in, in an academic career by being a professor of entrepreneurship. You had to be a deep driller in finance, marketing. You had to have a discipline. And entrepreneurship wasn't accepted. It was the interaction of many disciplines, but for reasons I don't fully understand except tradition, you, you couldn't get, get a PhD in entrepreneurship. I believe that's changed now, and I get uh, questionnaires from PhD students who are obviously studying entrepreneurship, so Chuck, you can describe the pedagogy better than I can, but is it true that it's now a legitimate subject? Uh, it, it certainly is a legitimate su subject. There's, that's a different question than can you get a PhD in it. Uh -huh. uh, so at the Stanford Business School, there are people who write dissertations on entrepreneurship, but they still get, dis they still get their degree in a discipline. Okay. So that's a, that's a minor uh, variation. So Peter, um, how did we get you attracted to Stanford Business School? What is it that allowed us to uh, capture you when uh, you were uh, in the middle of raising a family. You, uh, if you read Peter's Vita, you know he's got more activities on it than uh, uh, you can actually get on two pages, uh, single spaced. How do we, how do we capture you? Well, I got a rather frantic uh, phone call from Dean Roberts saying that uh, Pitch had asked if. Uh, he could make uh, his 12th year, his uh, last year of teaching. He was glad to continue to work with students, but didn't want the overhead of running the course and getting the syllabus together and everything. And um, would I uh, consider getting involved? I should say at the time, uh, Stanford was a large limited partner of our firm. <laughs> so ah. uh, when um, <laughs> a major investor in your firm calls and asks you to do something, you... Uh, tend to be uh, more enthused maybe than you might <laughs> otherwise. But um, also, um, we had cooperated, uh, Sierra Ventures, uh, let's see, at the time I came down here, we were on, I guess, our fund four. And we had, in our first four funds, we had cooperated with Harvard to write quite a few cases, because there wasn't a load of, back in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, right. there wasn't a load of uh, uh, case material about the venture capital business. And when some of those cases were taught here, I would uh, come down as a guest, just like any of us. Uh, right. uh, John uh, alluded to the fact he had a lot of he has a lot of guests uh, in during the time he was teaching here. So I had, um, aside from being in the classroom as an MBA student, uh, I came down and uh, was involved in the teaching of this actual sort of venture capital related material, and. Um, I, uh, so I agreed when, when Stanford called, I went down, I think I met with you, I met with a number of people. Um, I was a fairly uh, young guy considering the, the kind of the giants I was replacing, I was a fairly young guy at the time. And um, so there was some skept skepticism about that. So they said, well, why don't you just do it for a year and we'll all see how it goes. And I said, that's fine. Not realizing that the, the first year is all the work, right? You got right. to, uh, right. Pitch had left the course in great shape and the dean said, listen, he said, why don't you do this for a year? Don't mess it up, you know, Pitch has things yeah. in a good place. And um, uh, he said the one or two things you might do is you might try uh, and talk more about the business of venture capital. Uh, Pitch's work was about venture capitalists and entrepreneurs trying to create value together. And, um, but the deans at the time were smart enough to see that adventure was becoming a real industry. So he said, maybe you could do some uh, uh, material about where venture capitalists get their money, how they get their money, how venture capitalists are paid. And I said, oh, my partners are gonna love this, you know, if I, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, basically, uh, so the, the first step was to put a front end on the course that set some context 
for all the work that, that Pitch had there about venture capitalists and entrepreneurs doing deals together. And similar, I think, probably to both John's experience and Pitch's experience, from the first year forward, it was clear that the students were there because they wanted to learn about the venture business, but it was more likely because they were going to be consumers mm -hmm. of venture capital rather than that uh, 80 kids, uh, 80 students in the class wanted to be purveyors of venture capital. They didn't all want to be venture capitalists, but the students were smart enough to realize, gee, if I'm going to get in a relationship with this person and it's going to be a long-term relationship that's going to affect how my venture goes, if I understand where do they get their money from and, and how are they paid and, and what's on the dashboard of a venture capitalist as he or she drives to work every Monday morning getting ready for their weekly partner meeting, you know, that that could help me be a more effective entrepreneur. So um, uh, I think the fact that I had an existing relationship with Stanford of a business nature that um, uh, also uh, our firm had participated in creating quite a few cases and I'd actually seen them taught here and I had some sense of what an exceptional place a business school was. Those factors were all important in, uh, in deciding to, uh, uh, my, my, wife's, my wife didn't think this was a great idea. She didn't think I needed another job, but uh, um, uh, she's even come around on that, so that's good. Well, so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. And uh, you alluded to the fact that, that um, things have changed a little bit in your course, so why don't you say a little more about that? Um, I mean, for instance, uh, when Eric Schmidt, who was a uh, uh, Princeton classmate of yours, I think, uh, went to Google, uh, you got him to come uh, participate in your class. I kept thinking you ought to come and participate in my class. <laughs> uh, because I said, Eric, you're not a venture capitalist, you're an entrepreneur. And he said, no, 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 this is, fits with, with what Peter's doing. And uh, so tell us a little bit about how you evolved it. Well, it's what, what Pitch was saying earlier, that, that all of this case material is best explored from the viewpoint of both the venture capitalist and the entrepreneur. And um, over the years, uh, I had um, uh, a tenure track member of the faculty who was very interested in entrepreneurship who sat in with me for uh, uh, a year or two and, and helped. And then about eight years ago, um, I approached Eric about his willingness to, uh, to help um, with uh, a part of the class. And he, this year um, in uh, 2012, uh, he helped out in uh, five or six of the classes. Andy Radcliffe was another person who uh, was going through a transition out of Benchmark and was thinking of spending more time at the school. And I said, gee, why don't you come and spend, uh, uh, you know, do a few classes with Eric and I and see how you like it. And then he very quickly launched his own uh, course. And, um, I've also uh, been able to get about uh, 22 or 23 venture capitalists to each contribute uh, five hours to the GSB during winter quarter and the business plan projects that uh, Pitch alluded to, the students still think it's too much work, and, uh, but we still have it as of part of the course. And um, I match each team that's writing a business plan with a venture capitalist that has relevant domain experience to the plan they're writing. And typically we have about 17 or 18 plans a year, so if I have 23, 24 VCs on the bench, I can make the best matches and some of them don't match up in a given year with a project. But it's all really about leveraging the fact that Stanford is here in the heart of Silicon Valley, that Stanford is so well regarded by so many people in the Valley, so intertwined, as we learned in uh, the New York, are so intertwined yeah. with, um, with the Valley, that uh, it's, it's pretty easy to, to leverage our presence and to get others to help. And when you have an experiential topic like venture capital and entrepreneurship, which is we're an academic institution, but it's an experiential topic. Um, uh, really, uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to leverage the environment we're in. So those have been the main changes, but it's basically uh, Pitch's course with a little venture capital industry front end, uh, three or four classes, and then uh, even more involvement. Although he had, I'm sure you had Jimmy Traybig came when you did uh, Tandem and you had uh, Swenson come when you did Jenna. You, you know, you had a, no, a number of classes. Nancy came when you did Nancy's Yeah, teacher. All, all the classes uh, were cases that were venture capital deals and the entrepreneur came. I think what you added 
of great importance was to study the industry the business itself. Yeah. We didn't really do that. We talked about that, but we didn't have a case about it or make it explicit. Well, there's been more of an industry to study in the <laughs> last 20 years. But so, uh, so I don't know what they're doing back here, but... Uh, Is that right? Whenever there's a meeting, they're creating something. That's creating right. something. <laughs> Entrepreneurial. People Change. generally mow lawns outside the board meeting. That's just <laughs> the way it works. Uh, so, uh, so pitch. Uh, uh, early on, what you were doing was you were bringing uh, Silicon Valley to your class, but in the in, in in the in the sense of bringing entrepreneurs to the class. Um, John, what about you and in, in the way in which you utilized our location here in Silicon Valley? How did that impact what you did? Sure. Well, the cases that I developed, the 35 cases, were primarily Silicon Valley cases that I've had some relationship with. So it was pretty easy to get the entrepreneur to come and share their perspective with the students. And, you know, I, uh, w w I look back very fondly on some of those discussions. I uh, uh, had one of the Facebook guys come about I guess it was about four years ago. The class ended at 12 o'clock, and at 12.30, I couldn't get the students out the door. They were having some kind of a meeting in there. So some of them were extremely popular, and uh, you know there was a real animated dialogue among the students and the guests. But one of the things that I've found in my experience teaching is that the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, and particularly the GSB alumni, are really thrilled to have an invitation to come back and share their experiences with their students. And, uh, you know, that's what it's all about. They, they want to give back, too. So it's easy to get them. Their schedules are a little tight once in a while. But uh, I look back, I think I only had one or two cancellations in 20 years, so I feel lucky. But, you know, that ambiance, that dialogue among the students and the entrepreneur was... I think a fair amount of their educational learning experience that they got out of my course. So you, you mentioned the alums, that uh, Stanford yes. alums that came back. And, yes. and of course, that's uh, a reasonably uh, significant subset of the venture community. Uh, so Peter, did you find that you were able to get Stanford alums more easily than you could get Harvard alums? Or, or how, how, did you, how did you see that? evolution or that uh, interaction evolving? Well, uh, first of all, just the sheer number of Stanford alums in the area, right. you know, and uh, it helps. And certainly um, the vast, vast majority of the GSB's graduates feel great about the place. And, and you know, as, as John said, are just looking for ways to be uh, helpful. Where I think our alums have been particularly helpful is um, you know, what's changed, in particularly in the last 10 years, is so many of the students, the MBA students, come into the course now already having substantial background. You know, as, as Pitch alluded to, and, you know, 25 years ago, there wasn't a ton of entrepreneurial background. So if you were teaching a class, you could pitch it at a fairly low common denominator. Mm -hmm. Now, you have some students who have already worked at a venture firm for a while or been successful entrepreneurs uh, before they even get here, and yet they're in a class with uh, some student from Chile who hasn't seen much of the venture capital, U.S. venture capital model, and you need to somehow or other be relevant to 78 different students. So having um, guests who come, and particularly guests, uh, just as Pitch did the course, I teach from 10 to 11.45, and normally I can get the guests to stay for lunch. And then the students that really want to get in, uh, as you said, have a special seminar, John, like they did with Facebook, you know, I, I can institutionalize that. So every day there's the class and then there's a period afterward uh, where, and if, the, if there's no guests that day, then the faculty just stay for lunch. And, um, you know, Andy's a proud alumnus of the uh, school. Uh, the classroom I taught in was a Radcliffe uh, classroom this year. I felt really good about that. But it, it's not only giving in a formal way, but, but just being on call and being available because so many of the students now are so much further down the path that they really, um, you can do connections and link people up in a way that, that really helps the educational process and maybe even helps them professionally. And our alums are just really warm about that. I mean, they... They just are looking for opportunities to help. We, we, are, we are truly fortunate where, where we 
exist here in Silicon Valley. Uh, Pitch, um, Peter mentioned uh, people, students from Chile and others. I know you spent time um, in Eastern Europe. And uh, say a little bit about what the curriculum that you taught here, um, what part of it might be relevant or irrelevant uh, for um, people around the world, particularly Eastern, Eastern Europe? The, most of the work I did in Eastern Europe was helping establish venture funds there and working with the venture fund managers in developing some criteria and some methods for running a venture firm. Uh, in, in the beginning, in the early 90s, there was very little similarity because what was happening there is most of those countries were taking old socialist companies or getting brand new companies and starting companies to serve markets that either weren't being served or, or being served badly. So that it was the application of technology to normal businesses that was what the business was and not so much the development of new technologies. But it's still, the other, it's still though, it was finding marketplaces. I think the biggest thing in Eastern Europe, it's still a difficulty is convincing people that the job of entrepreneurs is not to have technology, but to think of markets and know about technologies that can serve a marketplace, or if they learn about the technology first, the next thought is, who wants this? How can we, what product could we put this in that will be useful to other people? That is, I, I want to judge a venture capital, I should say entrepreneurial um, contest in, in uh, St. Petersburg, not too long ago, let's say 10 years, and not one of the en entrants had mentioned uh, marketing or markets. It was all about the technology and how, what, what a wonder it was, how difficult the technology was to do. So uh, one, that's, that wasn't quite, one had a vice president of marketing, and I said, well, what is that job? And he said, well, it's to sell the products that we make. Well, that's a pretty short sighted view of marketing. Of course, marketing we now know, and they teach it here in, in, in Harvard too, is marketing is pricing, distribution, and most importantly, it's the building. Marketers are involved in the design of products from the beginning. So uh, the, the thing that's different there, I, I, I gave a talk last October to 250 students studying entrepreneurship in, uh, in, in Moscow. So what I said had nothing to do with any kind of technology. I said, you can change your country by being honest. I said, if you, if you go out there and refuse to deal with people that want money for, for bribes or that will that, that do what you know in your heart is not honest, stick with those principles. You can change your country for the good. It got a little publicity, I might add, but, <laughs> but I didn't get kicked out of the country either. Yeah. Right. And uh, so, there was lots of questions about how can I do that if my boss wants to do it? How can I, what if other people make more money than I do? I said, I'm just telling you, if it's a group, you can stick together with a whole generation of people operating in a principled way and, and building companies based on uh, honesty and directness. It's very important. For you. It's more important for you and your country than whether you can make a few more bucks doing something else. And much more importantly than that, it will define to yourself who you are. It, it, you, you, you can look at yourself and say, I'm a really the, the best person I can be, and I'm making my country better. And uh, it, was, it was not 100% adopted by all the people there, I might say. <laughs> but they, there was a lot of skeptical questions. But then the sponsor of the meeting, Russ Nano, put it on their website. And uh, so it, that's where the publicity came. It wasn't big publicity, by the way. It was about as interesting, you know, look at the interest in this seminar. It was about that level of interest. So, so, so Pitch, we, we don't want to ask you if you've been invited back, but... Uh, oh, I have been. Uh, yeah, I have been. I, I uh, was invited back this summer. I couldn't go uh, because of getting some new knees. But, I mean, your, your question is, teaching people entrepreneurship in schools there is a much more fundamental job. You're teaching people to think about marketplaces, think about adapting technologies to serve marketplaces, and running companies in a very straightforward way. The only... The big difference nowadays is we're still operating on the front edge of technologies and using things as in our famous Facebook and Twitter and those companies. Uh, and they have 
companies like that, but mostly they come up after it's been done in the United States or done in the Western world. So I can't answer your question except to say, is, uh, starting a company has many of the same problems, but they're serving different marketplaces and they're a different stage of development, even now. Well, thank you, that's very, very interesting. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I've got more questions, but I wonder if there are any questions from the audience that, uh, yeah, John. So the question was, if you didn't hear it, what, what's the implication uh, of uh, the venture capital community moving around the world? So who wants to take that? I'll just take a quick answer as far as Europe. The, the prevalence of the people guiding the venture funds being started in Eastern Europe were Americans. So the style of venture capital and the way it's done in Eastern Europe, that is Poland and east of there, is, is quite American. The, in Western Europe, uh, it's more it's more a banking mentality. You sit in your office, deals come. You may take off your coat in an emergency, but uh, it's kind of a more of a financial uh, operation. And there's some really fine venture funds. And there's one in Paris I'm close to, and several other places. But we 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 make an error when we try to translate what we're doing here to someplace else. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm sort of familiar with. China, I'm quite familiar with Japan, uh, and I, uh, I would say that uh, the model in Japan uh, is sim similar to ours because there's lots of companies. In, in China, I, mean, I better let somebody else talk about China, but uh, I would say that um, the, the main problem is taking the principles of venture capital where, where capital is looking for and assisting companies that are starting to succeed. And that fundamental is there. But the question of what companies can succeed, what markets they can serve, varies. So you gotta be very careful about trying to take the model that we see within 50 miles of here and saying that can work in, in especially in, in, in Europe or in, in, in Asia. So John and Peter, have your firms ever done any uh, expansion overseas? We haven't expanded, but we, we have made a couple of investments and I would, say my perception is that uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a tremendous push to have international exposure by US-based venture capital firms. And again, in my opinion, the jury's still out on whether that has been a, a successful effort for the limited partners of the funds. There's been a few successes and quite a few failures. I think people going over there, uh, those that make it are successful in hiring nationals to work in their office, people that understand the local culture, uh, regulations, uh, patent law, whatever have you. It's very hard for an American to go over there and be successful as a venture capitalist. I, I think the culture, particularly in Asia, I think the cultural differences are dramatic. and. Uh, you know, we know a little bit about venture capital, but our pattern recognition skills are honed in a completely different culture. Here, the notion that failure is okay is something that's a cornerstone of the success of the Silicon Valley. In many parts of the world, failure is not okay. And the ability of people to take the kind of risk that you need to take to launch a new product, to build a successful company, you know, is hampered by that fear of failure. So uh, I'm not convinced that the American model is transportable. I think many of the new opportunities that are launched as new companies in China and parts of Asia are basically copies of what was done in the United States. So, the formula is there. We know how to do it here. It's translating to a different culture that presents the challenges for us. Peter, what about Sierra? Yeah, I'd just make three quick observations. Um, first, with regard to here at the GSB, this was the first year where 
half of the students in 354 were either born outside the U.S. or had a degree from outside the U.S. They're very interested in the question you asked because they're taking a course on American venture capital to figure out how they can bring a lot of it home and how they can bring that growth and prosperity to their uh, lands of origin. So it's, it, it's, and I'm sure in the students you've taught here, you see the same thing. With regard to uh, Sierra, um, we've had uh, pretty good luck in India and China. A, we have uh, a firm in each of those venues that we are partnered with. We uh, have provided capital to them. We've helped them raise money. Um, Local partners. Yes, right, in both China and India. Uh, of the investing professionals at Sierra now, half are either Indian or Chinese. In fact, we're, um, uh, I'm in the minority now, actually. So uh, that gives you some sense of a local network and what the values are and who went to school with who and all the things that make the U.S. venture industry go around. Uh, but I think the last thing I'd say is one of the difficulties of transporting the U.S. model outside of the U.S. is that the venture model fits in part of the overall capital food chain. Uh, there's angels before and there's takeout options afterward. And particularly up until five or ten years ago, in most countries outside the U.S., there wasn't something like the NASDAQ. You know, so if you had about a five to eight year hold period on these investments, and it had to be liquid enough that it would be able to become a publicly traded company in the country where you were, you couldn't start at birth. You know, uh, venture capital was more like kind of merchant capital because they, they would start with a company that was already there and then try to move it along because they only have a certain period of time before your investors require you to get liquid. So it's, it's part of a broader food chain that, that's been one of the struggles too. Well, thank you very much, panel. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear your perspectives on the venture capital and particularly the venture capital uh, courses and how they've evolved here at Stanford. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.